today we're talking protein. How much do you actually need? What are the top misconceptions about protein? And where do you get your protein? So the answers may surprise you. Let's break it all down and share this video because this is one of the top questions in the industry. Let's take a quick look at the documentary called Eating for thoughts on protein deficiency. You'd practically have to be starving not to get enough protein. Protein deficiency is extremely rare, except in areas of the world where people actually are starving. It's really pathetic. We're the fattest nation on the planet, we eat like horses, and we worry about something that will only happen if we're starving. Instead of your first nutrition worry, protein should be your rock bottom last. Protein, where do you get your protein? If you're like many Americans, you might be thinking, but animal foods have nutrients I've been told I can't live without. Please enter the fantasy land of the animal food industries. In order to keep their profits healthy, some monumental myths have been cooked up about animal foods. If you worry about not getting enough protein, or if you think that milk builds strong bones, you've been brainwashed and your eating habits have been programmed by advertisements. Both protein and calcium requirements are stupendously easy to meet. In the case of protein, you could eat nothing but potatoes and get adequate amounts of protein. Wait a second. He just said that you could live on potatoes and get adequate protein. Let's check it out. If you eat nothing but baked potatoes all day, seven large baked potatoes, 1,950 calories, hmm, 52 grams of protein, up to 184% of your amino acids, you'd have 267% vitamin C, 125% of your iron, 430% potassium, 46 grams of fiber, well, he's right. There's a lot in potatoes. How much protein do we actually need? According to the World Health Association and several government guidelines, we need 0.36 grams per pound of body weight. So if you are, just let's use averages, if you're a 150 pound person, that's about 54 grams of protein as a baseline. Of course, that could be uh, a little less, a little more, depending on uh, if you're an athlete, if you're a pregnant mom, uh, some different factors like age, but for the most part, it's 0.36 per pound. We are trying to figure it out. If we are on a diet or have been on a diet, we most likely are trying to figure out protein. Do we need more fat with our protein diet? Are carbs the enemy? What's your blood type? Should we eat like Stone Age people? Certainly they had a lot of protein, didn't they? The statistics show how confused we are. Over 71% of us are overweight or obese. The consequences on our health, our morale, our kids is devastating. If it wasn't such a problem, it'd be funny. If you're confused about protein, join the club. Some of us eat protein to lose weight, while others eat protein to gain weight. Ponder that paradox for a second, or a few minutes. That's from bariatric surgeon and ex-proteinaholic Dr. Garth Davis, who wrote the book, which I have linked below. The flip side is that we may have too much protein. With high protein diets becoming more popular, a team collaborated in 2013 to research the findings of 32 studies about, quote, high protein and high meat diets. A premise of the study was the lack of data on potential adverse effects. Here are the key takeaways. And I want to do a quick disclaimer. I'm not a research scientist. I'm just presenting this study, which is published on PubMed.gov. I've linked it in the comments if you're interested in viewing it or showing your doctor. Calcium loss and bone loss. Animal foods are acidic, imbalances lead to dietary acid loads which have adverse consequences on bone. Greater risk of kidney stones. The probability of forming kidney stones was increased 250% throughout the period of high animal ingestion. 
an elevated risk of colon cancer associated with red meat intake. They also found that individuals on high protein supplements developed intermittent abdominal pain which resolved or quit after high protein intake was discontinued may precipitate the progression of cardiac artery disease. A diet that's too high in protein is actually a negative. In one of their conclusion statements, they state that extra protein is not used efficiently by the body and may impose a metabolic burden on the bones, kidney, and liver. These are health issues you'll want to check out yourself. favorite forms of protein. Um, I have some right here. We've got potatoes, we've got corn, we have tomatoes. Yes, tomatoes have protein. Um, I have a pepper here. It all has protein. Some have more than others and that's why a varied diet of plants is great. Could you eat all beans all day and get sufficient protein? Absolutely. In fact, beans are one of the highest protein plant products there are. That would be extreme. Obviously, we're not going to eat corn all day. We're not going to eat 2,000 calories of corn. We're not going to eat 2,000 calories of potatoes. You could, but it's not recommended. We looked at potatoes and how they provided adequate nutrition and protein. What about the other really common plant foods like corn? Let's check it out. Again, if we ate normal calories, around 2,000 for the day, but all corn, here's how it would stack up. We're gonna have about 15 cups of corn. That's our 2,000 calories, and that would be 63 grams of protein. It's gonna have plenty of our amino acids, all of them. We're gonna have plenty of vitamin C, plenty of vitamin A, 211%, plenty of potassium, and we have 59 grams of fiber. If we look at another plant food, beans, we're gonna use pinto beans here, that's about 10 cups, and we're gonna have huge protein, 120 grams of protein. Beans also have all of the amino acids that we need. They do not have enough vitamin C, that's why a varied diet is important. They are high in all the minerals that we need, and they have 94 grams of fiber. You don't need to combine different foods to make complete proteins. The bottom line is if you eat enough of a varied diet, you will receive all of your amino acids. So there's no need to combine them. What are the best forms of protein? In the quest to determine the most beneficial source of protein, we need to first review a few issues. For the sake of time, we're only addressing animal protein as a nutrition or protein source. We are not covering anything else in this video. Let's dive into three issues, fiber, cholesterol, and TMAO. Animal protein in an unprocessed form has zero fiber. We're not getting the recommended amount of fiber. It's estimated that only three to 5% of us get enough. That means that around 95% of us are deficient. We all have regular eating habits. When we eat a certain amount of calories or volume of food every day, we choose calories from either plant sources or animal sources, commonly a combination of both. However, the more that we choose from animal sources, the less fiber we get. We may not be aware of it, but when we choose animal foods more often for our calorie and nutrition source, we sacrifice fiber-rich plant choices. What's so great about fiber? Natural fiber from plants, not the manufactured fiber in a lot of today's processed foods and bars, performs critical tasks. 
It detoxes the body. It's the best way to get rid of extra hormones, fats, chemicals. It promotes weight loss. You'll fill up faster. Fiber absorbs extra calories and your body works harder to process it. It lowers diabetes to risk. Several studies have proven this. Fiber lowers heart disease by mopping up extra cholesterol and saturated fats so it doesn't settle in your arteries. And these are just a couple of the highlights. There's more that we're learning about high fiber diets. It's gotten so bad that lack of fiber is high on the government radar as a nutrient of public health concern. They state low intakes are due to our low intake of vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. Need an anecdotal clue? Over-the-counter revenues of laxatives and like products are now a $2 billion a year industry. Almost all these issues are cured with, you guessed it, eating more whole food plants. The book Fiber Fueled takes a deeper dive into this epidemic. The studies and research are pouring in with nearly 13,000 papers on the topic in the last five years. One quote that stands out, 70% of our immune system lives in our gut. From the book, proteins from plants increases the growth of anti-inflammatory microbe species while suppressing destructive ones. On the flip side, diets high in animal protein do the opposite. They increase growth of inflammatory microbes. I have a link to the book in my comments below. I mentioned a tidal wave of studies coming out about how our gut affects us. Here's one that's surprising. There's a strong mind-body connection. This paper quotes, several studies strongly support the association of the gut microbiome in the development of depression. You can see in the citation that this article was published in August of 2020. How much saturated fat and cholesterol can we handle without having negative impacts on our health? Cholesterol, what is it? It's a fat, it's a type of lipid. Cholesterol is only found in animal meats and animal products like dairy, chicken, fish, and eggs, hamburger, steak, ham, bacon, and so on. You may have heard that we need cholesterol. Yes, we do, but our liver makes all that we need. Getting rid of extra dietary cholesterol is hard, especially if we eat it day after day after day after day. Check online like WebMD. You can't exercise it off, sweat it off, or burn it for energy. Let's take a quick look at a highly recommended documentary. It's from medical researcher Mike Anderson. I've linked it below. It's available on YouTube. and see what he has to say. Ancient humans ate over 800 varieties of fruits and vegetables. We can eat an unlimited amount of plant foods with health enhancing effects, but we can only eat a tiny amount of animal foods before our arteries start to get clogged. Cholesterol has been called the animal's revenge because the animals you eat leave a little bit of themselves behind in your arteries every time you eat them and they'll kill you from their graves. Our liver produces all the cholesterol we'll ever need on its own and the requirement for cholesterol in our diet is exactly zero. Next up, TMAO. What is it? When we eat certain nutrients found in animal proteins, our gut breaks them down to TMA, then our liver converts it to TMAO. Too much TMAO has been linked to increased risk of coronary heart disease. This article appeared recently in the American College of Cardiology Updates. You'll notice it starts off saying, reducing animal product intake and following a primarily plant-based diet may decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease. We're getting to the down and dirty. In the book, Proteinaholic, Dr. Garth Davis, a bariatric doctor and recovering heavy animal protein eater makes a very visual statement, quote, you almost have to wear a hazmat suit to handle a raw piece of chicken. In 2014, 97% of chicken breast contained bacteria. Of course, we all know that. We don't let anything else in the kitchen touch anything else that has even possibly touched that raw meat. Ideally, it should be away from all the other food. We need to cook the bacteria and pathogens out of our food. Restaurants have to carry disclaimers when not cooking your meat well done, and that leads to some of the why crowded factory farms. We like to believe that animals we eat are on farms, grazing open fields, experiencing sunlight and space. That's not true. The vast majority of meat comes from concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs. 
The, this video will not discuss the plight of animals raised in CAFOs. You can research that if you choose to. The purpose of this video is to look at issues regarding our choice of protein. The definition of a CAFO is housing more than 1,000 animals or 1,000 pound unit equivalents. So 1,000 cows, 2,500 pigs, 125,000 chickens. To demonstrate the massive scale, we have to look at a negative output, manure. The CDC financed a study to understand the impact on communities around concentrated feeding operations. Quote, large farms produce more waste than some U.S. cities. A feeding operation with 800,000 pigs could produce over 1.6 million tons of waste a year. Another way to look at it is the animals we are eating produce over 10 times the waste as the entire U.S. human population. By the way, that waste does not undergo wastewater treatment. Again, this video will not address these other issues. By the numbers, most meat comes from factory farms. 99% of our turkey and chicken, 98% of our pigs, and 70% of the cattle. This is data from the 2017 USDA cited below. You may be buying labels such as natural or all natural, which means nothing, except that there are no preservatives or artificial ingredients in it. Natural or all natural does not address living conditions, added hormones, or antibiotics. The next subject. We don't know exactly what the numbers are for antibiotic use in animals raised for food. We, meaning the government, is working to establish reporting parameters. While we're getting more accurate, the current estimates are millions of pounds of antibiotics a year are used in factory farms, which addresses the chronic issues of crowded living conditions. 70% of all the antibiotics used in the United States are estimated to go to farmed animals. Some improvements are being legislated, for example, using antibiotics for medically necessary needs only, not adding them for, for preventive maintenance or growth enhancement. There are a lot of red flags waving. In 2019, in a United Nations report entitled Securing the Future from Drug-Resistant Infections, there are some powerful statements. Using the word urgent, they report that alarming levels of resistance have been reported and that common diseases are becoming untreatable. Dr. Margaret Chan, previous director of the World Health Organization, also published her warning, quote, a post-antibiotic era means, in effect, an end to modern medicine as we know it, things as common as strep throat or a child's scratch knee could once again kill. Y'all ready for some good news? I sure am. database was created of 3,100 different types of foods that we eat from the most common to the most exotic to the most rare and what they found comparing animal products to plant products was that plant products have about 64 times the amount of antioxidants than animal products. Antioxidants are very important for us to fight off cancer, free radicals, things like that. If we back up a little bit and look at some of the clues that nature has for us, perhaps you look at uh, milk for babies, right? Human breast milk for babies to thrive is actually fairly low uh, in protein compared to cow's milk. Cow's milk has about three times the amount of protein as human breast milk. So there's a clue right there. Human breast milk, the nutritional profile is also much higher, about double in carbohydrates than cow's milk. Baby cows and baby humans are very different. As Let's do an exercise. Let's keep it really simple. What if we broke down a 2000 calorie day with 10 items? What if they were all vegetables and fruits? So 10 items equals 2000 calories. If you actually did this, if you actually ate that list there, what would the nutrition package be? Let's find out. Remember, no grains, no legumes, no protein category, just vegetables and fruits. First up, we have our protein, 96 grams of protein in that 2000 calories. The specific amounts of protein are listed on the left with our 200 calorie portions. So 200 calories of broccoli has 17 grams, 200 calories of bananas have, has three grams and so on. 
Remember, the RDA average for a 150-pound person is around 54 grams. There are variables such as activity, age, pregnancy. Check with your doctor to learn about your needs. Next up, we have fiber. We have 132 grams of fiber. We've got 287% of omega-3s. Note that all these nutrition counts are suggested RDAs for a 150-pound person. We've got 225% of amino acids, 1,800% of all the daily vitamins, exception of D and B12. We've got 193% of calcium, 265% iron, zero cholesterol, zero. And we have 182 ounces of water. That's almost a gallon and a half of water. Water is a vital nutrient. The European Journal of Clinical Nutrition spells it out. It's a building material, solvent, reaction medium, nutrient carrier, shock absorber. It's essential for the maintenance of health and life. Let's look at this again. So you would flood your body with protein, fiber, nutrients, water. Of course, there's no way we can eat all of these fruits and vegetables. Maybe you could, but that is a lot of food. It's just a demonstration of what fruits and vegetables have. Another way to look at this, because I want to give you the visual, so that 2,000 calories of fruits and vegetables, here's how many cups that is. That is 80 cups of food. I don't think anybody could actually eat that amount. To give you the visual, you would have to fill this entire thing with our food from the day to get your 2,000 calories of all the different kinds of fruits and vegetables we have. So that is a lot of food. I don't think anyone can actually eat that amount. Our American diet called SAD for standard American diet may not be doing us any favors. As obesity and chronic disease rise, the average lifespan is declining. From 2015 to 2017, lifespan trended down in the United States. Other countries like Sweden and Canada have lifespans three or four years longer. But we spend more on healthcare than any other country. What's going on? Well, six out of 10 adults have a chronic disease, heart disease, cancer, diabetes. Chronic disease is defined broadly as a condition that lasts one or more years and limits daily activities. Being overweight or obese contributes to chronic diseases. According to the CDC, over 70% of Americans are now overweight or obese. What about prevention of chronic disease? Prevention is the mission behind a new field in medicine called lifestyle medicine. Members have a lofty goal to eradicate the root causes of chronic disease. They rely on evidence-based approaches from different angles, regular exercise, plenty of sleep, stress management, and avoidance of risky substances, and a whole food plant-based diet. This review of the relatively new field of lifestyle medicine demonstrated dramatic impacts on health and survival. You can find this report and the American College of Lifestyle Medicine website online and linked in the comments below for more information. In the introduction of this review, I point to a quote here. They state, more than 80% of chronic conditions could be avoided through the adoption of healthy lifestyle recommendations. Here's another highlight. A healthy lifestyle, including a whole food, plant-based diet regimen and moderate exercise has been shown to result in long-term weight loss similar to reduced calorie diets, but with better results in overall health. The Lifestyle Medicine publication quotes more promising outcomes of studies about diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and comparisons between animal protein intakes and plant protein. Obviously, their viewpoint is in their name, Lifestyle Medicine. Lifestyles and health habits they subscribe to in their medical practices. Let's look at Canada's food guide. Remember, their lifespan is higher, yet their medical per capita spending is lower. Canada's new food guide is based on a review of evidence, scientific reports, and data across the world. That's what they state. The visual here that they provide is 50% fruits and vegetables on the left there, 25% or one quarter whole grains, and one quarter protein foods. For that quarter of the plate's protein, they state, choose protein foods that come from plants more often. 
We can see some legumes, nuts, seeds, soy products, along with the animal protein examples like the egg and the fish. It's interesting to see the visual on how little the protein size is in comparison to the fruits, vegetables, and grains. a varied diet of plants, fruits and vegetables, starches, and you will get enough protein and you will thrive. Oh, I was hoping it would come to this. What do I eat? If it's all plants, I'm so glad that you asked this question. There has never been a better time to go plant-based. There are so many fantastic blogs out there, recipes. Looking at breakfast, here's some oatmeal waffles, we've got some crispy hash browns. By the way, these are no oil. So if you've got a good pan, it's guilt-free hash browns. Bubbling cheese sauce, so many applications. And here we've got eggs, better dicked is what I call it. Beautiful tomato, avocado, loaded sweet potatoes, everything you can think of on there. And crispy cauliflower bites. Here we have some bean meatballs. I do a little, a little checkerboard of cheese sauce and the marinara, nice appetizer effect. If you've got smoke seasoning, you've got bacon, tempeh on the left there, little coconut bits on the right for salads. Soups galore, pots and pots of soup, cream of broccoli, we've got corn chowder. There's some beta carotene soup, carrots, butternut squash, big, lovely, no tuna sandwich, and look at that salad. Here's another idea. Rethink meat, grains, mushrooms, seasonings, taco meat. Look at the color here. That is a kale pasta. And then look at that salad on the right. Vegetables are so beautiful and they're so filling. They're so tasty. You just want to rethink everything. Brussels sprouts, a wrap, some potato salad. Mushrooms and wild rice all-time favorite and then holidays you've got a neat loaf you've got some mashed potatoes and gravy another couple killer salads there no labor tamales on the left jackfruit tortilla soup on the right keeping with the mexican theme some loaded nachos lots of cilantro you can see the deprivation is just not uh, not too bad here chocolate chia seed pudding, special occasions, mango cheesecake. What about a triple berry cobbler or maybe another plain cheesecake with some raspberries? You can see it's just fantastic food. A lot of the recipes are on my channel. And if you don't see one, if you want me to make something, leave a request in the comments and your video could be up next. I'll customize it for you.